I majored in film studies with a specialty in screenwriting, got my uh, master's of art, arts degree, I'm rambling, but let's see, I went down to LA in 2014 and I lived there until March of 2018. Uh, some of the most miserable years of my life, but uh, I would, uh, I still, I still learned a lot. I worked for a couple of small, uh, small film distribution companies in that time, but mostly suffered at the Wilshire Union Home Depot, or as I like to call it, the Ninth Circle of Hell. But I did, however, get a very nice job down there, which I still have that I do remotely. I am a script reader for International Screenwriters Association. International Screenwriters Association is a group of people that actually works through several different screenwriting competitions, including um, Table Read My Screenplay, Table Read Park City, Emerging Screenwriters, Creative Screenwriting. So um, if any of you have ever sent in a script to any of those companies, I might have been the one to crush your dreams. And that just makes me feel warm inside. <laughs> so. Let's see, uh, a lot of you are probably wondering about what it's like to be a script reader, uh, what are the benefits, and uh, what are the education you can get from doing it, and uh, perhaps how one can get a uh, script coverage job. So first thing we're going to talk about is how one gets the job. It's actually a very um, interesting process, but it's actually a little bit more easy than you might think. I, uh, I got my job because uh, I was doing volunteer work at um, with a group of people called New Filmmakers LA and I was able to meet somebody at a party who was able to give me an email address for some people that actually worked with international screenwriters and I got in touch with them and I said hey if you have any positions open for a script reader I would be down for that. Now the interview process is actually very interesting. They don't bring you in to sit you down, they don't gauge your personality, they're only interested in one thing and that's how well you can evaluate a script. So the interview process is as follows. They send you a script and they have you write coverage on it. If they like the coverage, you're on board. What I don't know is if this is a script they have just lying around that they use for interviews or if they actually use a script that's actually in, um, in circulation. I think it might actually be circulation because uh, I actually got paid for that one, which was nice. <laughs> so anyway, there are three types of coverage you're going to do. Um, at least for this particular company. Some companies will only have one type of coverage. But international screenwriters, they have three different types of coverage that you do, each one with their own certain set of parameters. Uh, the first type, which is the easiest, is uh, partial coverage. And that, they give you a script and you only read the first 20 pages. After that, you write about a page to two pages of coverage. And now coverage is basically you giving your opinions on the script. You say if you liked the characters, if you, didn't, if you did or didn't like the characters, you explain why. You talk about it, whether or not you liked the dialogue, whether or not you liked the action, and you also talk about whether or not the script has been properly formatted. Basically, you tell the writer if you liked it or if you didn't, and you offer them some pointers to improve their work on a later draft. And that's the same across all types of coverage. Now, the great thing about partial coverage is you can knock that out in an hour. That includes both the reading and the writing portions, or at least I can. I write quick and I read quick, too. Then you get to full coverage. That's when you read the full script and you write about two and a half to three pages of coverage. Now uh, those take a little bit longer. Generally the reading portion of coverage is actually the longest portion, especially when the script is um, very boring. I'm going to cry now, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> then you get to my personal favorite, which is, uh, which is extended coverage. Here you read the full script, but you write five and a half to six pages of coverage. Now that takes a while. It takes at least two hours to write a piece of coverage that long. For full coverage, it's only about 45 minutes. And uh, each one gets you a different fee. Uh, for partial coverage, you get $12. For full coverage, you get $15. And for extended, you get $45. And uh, me, this actually earns me a pretty decent amount of money. It's not a full-time position. It's one I only do part-time. But generally, I'll do a batch a week of about seven scripts. And that'll net me about $132. So in a month, I will usually earn about an extra 500 bucks. So that's actually not, uh, not too bad. But then again, I only have a part-time job, so uh, I have more time to do coverage. But if you want to do coverage, I mean, uh, they actually don't have any real stipulations as to how much you have to do. I mean, if you're willing to only take 
two scripts a week, they'll still want to have you on board. Because the great thing about these companies is they get a lot of scripts and they're looking for readers all the time. Because readers come and go on a regular basis. So if you send them an email and they say they don't have any positions open, email them a week later, they'll have something. It'll, it might just take a bit to impress some of these people. But anyway, so what, uh, what is the actual process like? Well, um, depends on the script usually. The coverage is pretty much the same each time. I actually have a specific system that I like to work with uh, where I discuss, the, I discuss the technical aspects of a script before I get to the narrative ones. That usually takes me a couple paragraphs. I talk about if the writer did well on the prose. I, uh, I see way too many writers who write their scripts as if it's a book, which you do not want to do ever. But believe it or not, most writers actually are getting better with that, which uh, makes me happy because that's uh, one less thing I have to talk about. <laughs> but anyway, from there you go. From there, I go to you know talking about the characters, usually a hero and a villain, if they have a good arc. Talk about dialogue, and from there I go to the actual meat of the story, whether or not the writer adequately sex, sets things up, if the climax is satisfying, etc. So, what are the benefits to being a script reader? Well. Well, obviously money. Money's nice. You know, I like to get paid to crush people's dreams. It just makes me feel warm. <laughs> but one of the things that, uh, in all seriousness, one of the, my favorite things about being a script reader is the fact that it helps me learn a lot. Uh, what, I'm gonna, what I'm about to say sounds like a line from a bad screenplay I've probably read at some point, but it is nonetheless true. If you're a script reader, you're going to see a lot of the same mistakes over and over and over again. There are generally three types of scripts you're going to read. One is your run-of-the-mill script, which is basically just kind of bland. You know, it's boring. There's nothing offensively good. Uh, sorry, there's nothing offensively bad about it, but there's also nothing outrageously good about it. It's just kind of a run-of-the-mill story that, well, what can you say about it aside from you know telling the writer how to make it more unique and stand out better? I'd say that's about 70% of the scripts you read. And then about 20% of the scripts you read are the ones that are just so outrageously inept that uh, they make you sad inside when you read them. I'm talking about they can't even get the formatting right. Like you just open up the script and you can tell right away that it's going to be a train wreck. And I've read, I think, about 10 scripts like that in the two years that I've been doing this job. <laughs> Those are pretty, uh, pretty sad. But then you get those. Uh, then you get that last group of scripts, which is exceedingly rare, and those are the ones where you read them and you're like, "Wow, this guy knows his stuff. I can learn something from this guy." And I think I've only read about two scripts like that that just blew me away from the beginning. And uh, yeah, because you do run into very talented writers who do get the courage to send their work in. And the thing is, each type of script will teach you something new, even the terrible ones, which may have a lesson as simple as. Okay, I saw this guy do this, so I should do the exact opposite and I'll be good. But there are those. But if you see the same mistakes repeated over and over again, like poor dialogue, poor pacing, and, and things like that, if you write, it's a lot harder to put them into your own work because you start looking at your own work as if it's a script you're covering. What I like to do when I cover scripts, I never want to hurt a writer. I try to approach a script as if I wrote it and I think, okay, how can I explain this to me in a way that would help me make this better? Because I'm trying to give writers the kind of help that I wish I got when I was you know, out in LA doing the kind of work I was doing. I never want to hurt a writer. I always want to help them improve their work. And I try to leave a little bit of encouragement at the end, even if I really, 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 really didn't like the script they send in, which does happen on occasion. It's rare, but there will be times where that occurs. So. I think that pretty much covers the basics of the job, and uh, you know I can open the floor to any questions any of you might have. So, uh, I guess, what is the? How do they? How do you? How does? How do they get the scripts that get to you? What's the process for that? Well, the scripts that they send in are sent in by a lot of writers, not unlike yourselves, and not not unlike me too, because I'll probably send in some of my scripts to these competitions myself. But yeah. they, they, they have writers who are looking to either try and get clout for their, for their work, 
because if a script you know gets high in a screenwriting competition that actually gives it more clout if they want to pitch it around to a studio so that's one of the things that a screenwriting competition is good for if you're an up-and-coming wordsmith. Other times it's just people looking for good critical evaluation of their work so they can know the kinds of things they need to fix. Generally, if somebody pays for extended coverage, they're people that are less interested in winning a competition and more interested in figuring out how they can fix their work. It's, uh, it's generally full coverage people that are interested in winning. So competitions like emerging screenwriters and table read park city and the like they will open the floor to writer for writers to send in their scripts for a fee and then what happens is the 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 heads of uh, isa they will get the scripts and they will send them out to various writers and this is handled electronically well they don't send me a hard copy what i do is i get a digital pdf they actually send me a a number uh, a graph document in Microsoft um, in Microsoft Office, and that will include a temporary link to the script, so I can download a PDF. And the link is and the link is deleted at the end of the competition cycle. So yeah, the scripts come from you know up and coming writers who are either interested in getting their script clout, or they're just looking for some helpful tips on how to improve their work. Are you just ran I assume that when you get an assignment, it's just randomly assigned. Sometimes, uh, most of the time, yes, but sometimes uh, a writer who will, who will have sent in a script before will actually request that it be covered by the same person. So I've actually covered the same, uh, not the same script, but uh, multiple drafts of the same story several times. I remember uh, I've done that at least twice. I know the last time uh, there, I got sent this particular script a third time, and I read through it, and the writer didn't change a whole lot of it. So. You know, I, I told my boss, I'm afraid I won't be able to give him anything more than I've already told him the last time because I'll, I'll only have the same notes. So I got a different script based on that. Now, that actually does open up another thing that I didn't discuss before. Uh, one of the things that's really great about being a script writer is it is something that you can fit into your schedule because they give you the type of work that, uh, the type of workload that you request. If you only want to do one a week, but they really like your coverage, they will be more than happy to have you do that. If you have your hours cut at the store and need some extra work, you can actually request extra scripts and they'll send them right away. If you have a little bit of a heavy workload and you need to get a little bit of the pressure taken off, you let them know, hey, I can only do five this week. Is that okay? And they'll, they'll uh, go ahead and you know, take that off and only give you five or whatever number you request. And if they really like you, they'll actually pay you a few extra dollars to try and keep you on board, which they've actually done with me. Um, full coverage usually only nets and that's somebody about $15 a pop. They pay me 17 because a lot of writers have been happy about the stuff I've sent, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, apologize for rambling. So is the ratio of good to one out of 100? I'd say, um, I'd say when it comes to absolute knockouts, yes. When it comes to good, it's more like I'd say Maybe maybe uh, three out of ten is when I get into like eighty percent and up, because one of the things you also do is you also score the script based on certain parameters. Like um, they send you a score sheet where you score the script one out of ten, with one being horrible and ten being amazing, based on ten categories like dialogue, marketability, etc. And then based on that, that'll add up to a score out of a hundred. Does the writer get the sheet? I'm not sure if the writer gets the sheet. I think that's just for the judges. But the writer does get the coverage I write. It's a number. Yeah. Yeah. The writer gets the, writer gets the coverage, and that's, what, uh, that's so generally what they say. Front load the first 20 pages? Front load the first 20 pages? Well, if they do partial coverage, yeah. <laughs> if they want partial coverage, absolutely. I will say this. The first 20 pages, I'll get to you in a sec, Steve. Uh, the first 20 pages are among the most important of any script. I know Scott will probably tell you that. And I've read a lot of scripts where it takes way too long for the plot to get going. And then I've read other scripts where by page 15 they're rolling. And those are the ones that are real, real breeze to read through. Did you have any other uh, questions? Um, I will, but not really. All right. And Steve, what's your oh, question? It kind of relates to that because I've heard it was like the first seven. That something actionable has to happen within the first seven pages. Or, you know, translate seven minutes of a gig. 
Well, you definitely want to open up with a big rousing number, like the girl getting eaten by the shark from Jaws. That's in the first page. <laughs> but by page 20, you want to know around where the plot is going. You still want to open up with a big rousing number, but sometimes you, sometimes you can't. Like a, a good example is Predator. I don't think you even know there's an alien in the movie until 25 minutes in. But the characters still have a goal that they're going towards. They're going into Central America to rescue these guys. And by, I think, 18 minutes in, they're blowing the hell out of the chateau in the middle of the jungle. So it's a pretty active, it's a pretty active first act of the script, even though the alien doesn't show up until the end of the first act. It sounds like all the characters should be in the first 20 pages, too. Generally, if they're significant, yeah. But there are, of course, exceptions to the rule. Lando Calrissian from Empire Strikes Back, I don't think he shows up until after the script is halfway over. But he's a nonetheless significant character. 40 pages kind of equates to act one, right? Pretty much, yeah. You want, you want to have the, the plot well underway, you know, by the end of page 20. What was your question? I was curious, how much leeway do you have for, I would say specifically like negative editorializing? Like if you get a script that is just poorly conceived from jump or the only constructive criticism you can provide is stop this now, <laughs> your main character is in blackface for the whole movie, or whatever it is, uh, what, what, what are your limits when it comes to stuff like that? Well, uh, they obviously don't want you to be mean because uh, they'll they'll get a lot of complaints. And uh, I've, had, I've read scripts where I was really tempted to be mean. I've, I've read a couple of, um, you know, I've read a couple of scripts that are just so ineptly written, they're not even formatted correctly. Like, they're written like books. You have, like, action prose, which is 15 lines long, talking about what a character's feeling on the inside. Or, uh, or, or God help you, or God help you if you get, like, a a Christian fundamentalist, everybody's going to hell but me script, which are just obnoxious. <laughs> and I've read, I've read about two of those. Now, generally, um, I, I, I try to be more amiable with a writer. Like, if I, if I, like say if I read a Christian fundamentalist script, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna say, you know, if you write the script like this, you're not gonna reach a broad audience. You want to spread a message, right? The best way to do that is to be amiable and approachable. And if you're mean like this, they're going to shut you down right away. They're not going to listen. So that would be how I would approach that. And if I just see a script that is um, an absolute clusterfuck, I, uh, I say why it's a clusterfuck. And I provide examples that the writer can look at, perhaps, to improve their work. Like, one of the things I enjoy doing when I write coverage, I like to provide examples that a writer can look at. So they can show how some, so they can see how something is done properly, and they can incorporate that into their work. Like, say, if all the characters talk in pretty much the same monotone, dead dialect that just has no life to it whatsoever, I can tell the writer, you know what? A lot of your characters sound the same. Why don't you watch a movie like The Princess Bride and look at how unique each character's voice is? How Fezzik and Inigo Montoya—they're totally different in the way they speak. I want a character to leap off the page at me. Um, Long story short, I can't be mean, but there are actually creative ways you can get around being mean. The key is turn your rage into something constructive. And if you have enough rage, you can make it very constructive. Right. Yes, sir? Uh, are you freelance in this position? Meaning, like, do you have to sign an NDA that you're not going to work with um, other companies? I have to sign non disclosure agreements. It, as part of the scripts that I read. Right. Like, I can't share a lot of great information on the scripts I've read. Uh, but I am allowed to, um, I, I believe we're allowed to work with other screenwriting competitions. You know, I don't, I don't really think they, they mind that too much. Or like if you could get a job with a small production company doing coverage for them, or. Oh, they wouldn't mind that at all. Blacklist or something like that, where you could do that from home. Yeah, they wouldn't. They wouldn't mind that at all. If if you're working with a production company, they they don't care. You know what they what they care about are you know what you can give them, and it's also a job that there's a lot of fluidity to it. You know, if if you want, I mean, if you get enough clout, you know, they'll, they'll straight up let you take a month off. Like I've actually taken a couple weeks off, and they just say, okay, whenever you're ready, shoot us an email. We'll send you another batch. But yeah, in answer to your question, um, they might be a little bit iffy of you working with another competition. But if you're working with a company, they will absolutely not mind that at all. Well, my, I guess my real question is like, um, if you read a script that you think is like, you know, eight out of ten, and you can see a way to make it better, like if say it doesn't place in the contest, it doesn't do well, it's not a quarterfinalist, they get nothing out of it. Is there a way for you to contact that writer and say, hey, 
I think you could do this, yeah. and I, like you said, you work for a company in, in Los Angeles. You yeah. Take that. I don't remember what capacity it was, but like, if you knew a producer or somebody else that you could take it to, is that like? Out of bounds? No, that actually is something that they uh, that they let you know you can do. They just they just want to be the ones to facilitate the communication and then let you take it from there. So essentially, you could option a script from somebody, or not a script that you read. Like you could go to the person and just talk to them about either collaborating or like helping, not being their agent, but like helping them get it to somebody that might be interested in it. Yeah, yeah, you're allowed to do that. They uh, they have the they have the person's contact information, and if you really like a script and want to collaborate with a person, I personally haven't done it, but this is actually included in the in the job description they sent. All you have to do is talk with your boss and say, hey, this guy's script, I, I really like this guy's script. I'd like to start talking with this person. Right. So yeah, that is, you are allowed to do that. At least you are at ISA. All right. Are you reviewing single space or double space? Um, do you have a word count? No. Word count? Yeah. Well, it depends on the coverage. I know with uh, with partial, it's about 1,200 words. Once we get up to full coverage, that's about 3,000. And then extended coverage is double that. It's like 6K. Okay. So. Now, do you get copy, do people copyright their stuff they send in? Um, Not really. I think a lot. I think a lot of it is is probably copyrighted. I mean, obviously, something is already intellectual property, and there's a nice convenient email trail. Yeah, so. That's well, that is, this is true. This is true. I, I think uh, some writers do. Some writers rely on the poor man's copyright. It's a, it's a case by case thing. Are there any genre generalizations you can make, or genres that are hot, or better or worse, or ninety percent of your stuff in zombie movies? Or believe it or not, I haven't read a lot of zombie movies. Hey. Uh, I have read. Nothing in zombie movies. Yeah, I have read a lot of dramas, and uh, what I found out is. Uh, Dramas are very easy to get wrong. Right. Like a lot of them get really, uh, really preachy and melodramatic and soap opera y and uh, just ridiculous. Like um, I read one, I can't get into too much specifics, but it ended as a courtroom drama. And uh, it had two seven page monologues back to back. Oh my God. The entire final 15 pages was just. And you know what? I didn't even read it because I didn't have to, because, you know, it could just. I could just tell the writer, look, this is way too long. And I recommended that they watched a little movie called The Accused with Jodie Foster and look at how they did their closing argument, which was not seven pages, which is maybe a page. Just the novel template rather than the screen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes? So, to what extent, I mean, well, I guess maybe what's the line between creative coverage versus potential marketability coverage like this is this is a great story versus this is something that might sell well well me I know I know a lot of writers uh, a lot of coverage people like to uh, talk about something's marketability I tend to just focus on the quality of the story there's my no general hmm? there's no requirement either way of a, that you would have to cover that as a, as a dimension of <laughs> I include it in the score when it comes to the coverage I just focus on the story itself whether or not the writer told it well or at least uh, if I think they told it well. Um, I very rarely bring up marketability. I mean, uh, because, uh, because a lot of writers, you know, I know I am, a lot of writers really don't want to, really don't care about that. They just want to, they just want to hear if they told the story well. Because a story can be superbly told and not have a lot of marketability. On the other hand, it could be very terrible, but it can make like a gajillion dollars. So I just focus on, on quality of story, but I include marketability when it comes to uh, the scoring, and generally, most uh, most scripts kind of fall into the seven range. You know, like, kind of like a C marketability. But how do you make a judgment on marketability? Well, I look at what's trending at the theater. Okay. You know, I mean, obviously, if something is a superhero themed, you know, that'll be that'll be pretty marketable. Um, speaking of which, one of the worst scripts I read. Now this is one I actually can get into a little bit of specifics over because it was a straight up plagiarism. <laughs> but um, it, had, it, it had a nine on the marketability scale. The problem was it was literally Iron Man with the characters' names changed. I'm not even kidding. It was literally, it was literally just Iron Man. The dialogue was the same. Like word for word? Word for word. They even, they even had, you know, the set pieces were the same beat for beat. It had the same opening with somebody showing off a weapon system. And then it, and then it ended with, you know, 
not Jeff Bridges fighting the hero. <laughs> and then it even had not Jeff Bridges had that line, so and so did this in a cave with a box of scraps. And you know, I told the writer, you know, you got something, um, this may be marketable, but uh, You'll be sued. yeah, and, and if you want to draw inspiration from something, um, that doesn't mean you're copying it, you know? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's like drawing inspiration on that. Uh, has anybody here seen a little movie called Without Warning with uh, Jack, Jack Palance and Martin Lando? Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the long, the long one. That's the movie, isn't it? Is that with, uh, yeah. yeah, with Jack Palance and uh, Martin Lando. The thing is, it's about an alien that comes to Earth to collect humans as trophies, and it came out before Predator. But Predator is way better. <laughs> and funnily enough, the creature from that movie is played by the same guy that went on to play the Predator, Kevin no Peter Hall. Kidding. No kidding. <laughs> Kevin Peter Hall kept joking about it, you know, all the time. But better. Yeah, obviously. Predator better had the dreads. <laughs> right. Anybody have any other uh, questions? So do you review, like, do you do the, all, like, other stuff, like, like log lines, for example? Or do you review, like, or, like, little incidental things like that? Or even just, like, scene workshops where it's, like, you know, I don't want you necessarily to review the whole thing. You need to, like, partial coverage just this sequence, stuff like that, or is it always, it has to be a full script? Well, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's partial coverage, I can certainly talk about specific sequences, and even in full coverage, and especially extended coverage, if you want, you know, breakdowns of specific scenes, extended coverage is a great way to go, because I'll talk about, like, three or four key scenes in the script, why I think they work and why I think they didn't work. When it comes to long lines, I generally don't mention it, unless the writer didn't deliver what the log line promised. Because when I'm sent the spreadsheet, the score sheet, it actually includes a log line on the script, so I'll have a general idea of what I'm going to read. And I've actually read scripts where I read the log line and it's not the script I'm reading. Or if the log line is just very vague, like somebody has a date with destiny, and I'm like, okay, what does that mean? That tells me nothing about what's going on here. <laughs> so with... Uh with uh, 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 scripts that are marginally good, what can you, as a coverage person, do to help the writer? You know, really terrible scripts is pretty easy, and really great scripts is really hard, uh, because what can you give them? But a, a marginally good script, what's something you would tell somebody to improve it? Well, this is actually something that I encounter a lot. I encounter a lot of scripts that have really good ideas, they're just marred by poor execution. And if you tell the writer that, they have a little bit of confidence right away. So that's actually a good kind of encouraging message to keep somebody from giving up. Because I never want a writer to give up, even if I secretly do. But let's move on. Um, you know, talking about, a, talking about a marginally good script that has a great idea but needs to be improved, you know, you talk about the things that could be improved, like if the dialogue isn't good, if the characters are very bland, you talk about, you know, you weren't invested in the character's journey, what types of things they can do to make that character more engrossing and believable and memorable. You talk about ways to improve you know, set pieces and sequences. Uh, if the pacing is bad, you bring up the pacing and figure out ways to maybe combine certain scenes to make the script move along a lot more fluidly. That's the type of thing I like to do when I encounter a script that, again, has a lot of promise and concept, even if it comes across as fairly run of the mill. You had a question? Yes. Um, you do the coverage or something coming up for one of the contests, uh, how, do, how do you select them to move it along with the process? And that goes. Well, pretty much that goes along with the grade. Um, the script uh, moves along based on how, how well it's graded when it comes to me. And then uh, I'm not sure. I think the scripts end up going to some people above me who read the coverage, read the score sheet, and then they read the script after I look at it. And then those are, the, and then the the judge, the judges up there, I kind of judge the finalists based on the scores that we give them. So, script coverage, the kind of job I do, it's very much a vetting process. Since they have, so, since they get so many scripts, they're saturated with hundreds of scripts, perhaps even thousands of scripts, and they employ so many writers to try to try and, you know, dig through what they get to find the diamonds in the rough. But um, if I grade a script very high like say if it's like 88 and above, then automatically that goes up to the higher ups and then they give a look at it based on, based on my rate. I know that my boss, um, who I talk to on a regular basis, has actually, his, uh, his responsibility is actually to read a lot of the scripts that I score very high. So he's one of the judges above me. 
how many scripts in your history have you put at that level have moved on to the... 88 and above? Yeah. Well, I've been, I've been doing this for two years, so it's kind of hard to throw out in a number, but I say... Um, estimation. Estimation? Well, let me think. I'd say maybe 30. 30. It's not bad. Yeah, 30. It's like, it's like a couple a month. We'll get that. We'll get up there. And then, uh, and then I think I've only read two that have been like upper 90s. And I think I read one that I gave 100 to, which was just amazing. One in two years? One in two years. You know, it's, it, it, it was just... And the funny thing was, it was a drama. And those are usually the worst ones. But this writer did everything right. Uh, like, uh, I actually ought to look through my old emails, see if I can get in touch with that guy, because I still have my old, uh, my old things out there. Oh, it's a great script. It's amazing. What are some of the most common mistakes you see? Like, oh, common mistakes? <laughs> when it comes to screenwriting slash storytelling. Well, uh, there are there are four I'm going to get into. One is uh, one is prose, and that's um, when a writer is way too um, way too generous with their prose. Like they'll say what a character is feeling on the inside. <laughs> like uh, those ones. Usually I know right away if I'm in for, um, I'm in for a treat because I'll read a piece of prose that says, Janet felt betrayed that Rod could do this to her and she remembered the times that they used to play at the pond when they were 12. And I've literally read prose like that. And I tell the writer, just tell me what I'm going to see in here. That's all you need to do. And if, you, and if you can't tell the story with just that, then you need to figure out a way to do it. I say that nice, of course. Another thing is dialogue. Oftentimes I'll read scripts where the characters don't have a lot of individuality in how they speak. And when it comes to an ensemble, that's especially important when it comes to a script because I need to be able to tell the, the characters apart before I see an actor. Now a really good script will be able to do that right away. Like The Princess Bride is a terrific example. Aliens, Predator, those are wonderful ensembles. Another thing is pacing. Uh, sometimes I'll have a writer who will take way too long to get to the point when they can actually get to it from one scene. Like I'm covering one now that's about pirates. And there is a scene that takes place 15 pages in that could honestly, probably should take place at page five or maybe even less. But the biggest mistake I run into, and this is one that has killed a lot of really, really creative scripts that I've read, is overuse of exposition, where the writer feels the need to explain something way too much, and they're not brief with it. I read one script. It was a biopic on a real-life pirate. And the entire script was exposition from beginning to end. It was just the characters explaining the socio-political things that were going on at the time. There was no character development because they were all too busy explaining the story. And it became one of the most boring things I've ever read, which was so unfortunate because the log line had me really excited. Those are the four big things. Dialogue, prose, pacing, and exposition. Okay. Yes, Steve? In relation to that, uh, you know, I was always taught not to really put too much, if any, camera direction in a script, and I've always felt that was the way to go because being on the other side of it, I don't, I don't need the writer to tell me, or mm -hmm. if he's trying to tell me how to move the camera, you know, I may or may not agree. Yeah, <laughs> that's I, not part of, that should be in the script. Yeah, I'd say that's, 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 that's uh, number five, is people mentioning camera movements, which incidentally, I read a script that did that today. <laughs> Never ever talk about camera movement. That is your cinematographer's job. Now, if you want to be the cinematographer and the writer on it, great. But if not, that's something you do not want to discuss too much as a as a script yes, cover. That's all right for a shooting script, but not. It's all right for a scoot shooting script, not a spec script, like I read, which is all about the story, nothing else. Does anybody ever put music? In? Oh God, I've had people include YouTube links in their scripts. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> yes, Scott said no. Now I haven't had that happen in about a year, thank God. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, um, I, I had some strong words for that one. Never. Like, well, they will. Now uh, it's okay to include it as ambient music, I suppose, if you want to set the mood for the reader. But I will tell the writer, you know, it's possible you might not be able to get the song due to copyright issues. Right, right, right. Now, for, for the writing process, it's, it's okay to include it as ambience, but that's about it. Not a YouTube link, you're just saying. Not a YouTube link, no, no. If, they, if, like, if, like, say they reference a jukebox up right, in the right. corner that's playing Long Tong Sally, they can do that. Oh, it's in the scene. Yeah, if it's, if it's ambient in the scene, that's fine. Right, right. Did you go to the link? No. Okay. 
No, like there's no point because it shouldn't be there. It'd be amazing if the entire submission was just to, to rip roll you. <laughs> I, I, I've read. I've read a couple where I'm like, you know what, maybe. <laughs> hey, what stories do you want to see? Does your brain want to read that you're not seeing? I know that uh, generally, I mean, I like fantasy, science fiction, or horror. That, those are my genres. I like stuff that's, that takes me out of the real world and into something more unique. Now, I do read them a lot. I read a lot of fantasy, science fiction, and horror scripts. Um, a lot of them are just average. You know, they're just people trying to find their feet. I haven't. Reading outrageously bad stuff isn't as common as one might think. At least it isn't for me, since I've been reading more. Um, I generally don't want to read dramas. And it's not because I don't like dramas. It's because a lot of the dramas I get sent are from people who spend way too much time on the message and not enough on the story. It's like the story is supposed to be subservient to the message. When in a good script, it's the other way around. Like if you take a message out of a movie like, say, Zootopia, it's still a really good movie. It's a buddy cop movie with a compelling mystery, even if you take out the racism angle. And I read way too many scripts that get way too preachy with their messages. Even if I agree with them, I get irritated. So uh, I generally like to read stuff that's character focused, where the circumstances in the world are able to help help a character become more unique and interesting. I mean, Indiana Jones is a terrific character. Alien is a wonderful horror movie that has an amazing lead with Ellen Ripley. I read sci-fi and fantasy. I read a lot of sci-fi. Mm -hmm. I think it's character. Really yeah. It's yeah. A lot. Of, a lot of times, I'll read sci-fi and fantasy, and they're way too interested in the world building right. and so not enough on the character. But I hope that answers your question. I hope that was a good one. Okay. Put together your uh, profile. Can you put like preferences for what genres you would prefer to read? Like, I would definitely be able to offer more notes and helpful constructive criticism for these genres as opposed to these genres. You can do that. Uh, that that would actually be something that you would talk about with uh, with the person you work with. Mm -hmm. If you if like say if I want to only read like horror and sci-fi scripts one month, I can actually conceivably send an email to my boss, and if they have a large amount of those scripts, they will gladly send them to me. If, however, they get nothing but dramas, they say, well, we only got dramas. Is it not, I would think the majority of amateur screenwriters are looking at the things that they think they can sell, which are going to be horror, thriller, sci-fi, comedy. I would have to think that like, be, would overwhelmingly be the number. And that is true. That is true. A lot of times I do see scripts in, in those genres. But I've been surprised. Some months I've gotten nothing but dramas, and it's like the weirdest thing. <laughs> I don't know if maybe they send them my way because my, my, they, I, either they really hate me or people really like my coverage and they think maybe, oh, we'll send Eric the boring shit. I don't know. I meet the writing students at OSU, and I audit some writing classes there. Most of them are. Sci-fi fantasy genre. Yeah. Do you no Go ahead. Do you know anything about the writer when you get the script? Or are they sent to you blind? They're sent to me blind. That way, I have no. Uh, they don't want us to be biased in any way. Exactly. Yeah, like like they don't want us to be biased in any way. They don't want us to like hate a writer and then automatically we're gonna you know give them you know bad reviews because. They didn't, you know, they were dick during a Skype call. Yeah, they, they absolutely send them in blind, so it's just the story I'm evaluating. You don't even get the, the, the author's name. I do get the author's name. Oh. That, that's it, though. So you can know, like, so hey, like, this right, is a man writing yeah, for women. Maybe that's why it's they not don't sound so good. It's also, not totally blind, but it's decent enough. I generally don't pay attention to names, except when I, except when I do my coverage sheet. Uh, more, some people may be a little bit more biased, but uh, you do get the name. That's about it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but if you don't write a certain writer now, I mean, that's, yeah. you still know who it is. Yeah. Sometimes it's actually helpful. Like, uh, if, I get the, if I get two scripts by the same person, like, I've actually done that where I've covered in a single batch, like, two, three scripts by the same writer. So I could actually say, oh, hey, okay, I read all three of your scripts in this batch. Here are some of the common mistakes you do that you can look at. Here's something you do better in this script that you don't do better in this one. And that's actually sometimes very interesting. Like, I know this batch, I'm, I actually have two scripts by the same writer. So it, it's actually interesting to look at, um, like, say, if a writer works better in a specific genre or if a particular, if one particular script works better than another. Because I remember one batch, I got one script by this one writer that was actually a very good drama. 
and then, and then they wrote a comedy and it was just terrible. So. Do you see much comedy? Comedy is very rare. It is very rare. I've gone for like months without seeing comedy and I think that's because in a script it's a lot harder to get across because you don't have the benefit of a performance or actually watching a physical comedy. Like say if you read the script for Ghostbusters it's not nearly as funny as the movie because you don't have the performances, you don't have the way Bill Murray delivers everything so deadpan, you know? Well, most comedy, I mean, most American comedy is visual. Yeah. Most you know, Brit comedy is ironic, but it's still kind of visual. Yeah. How do you handle, like, like, the social import? Like, if you read a script and you go, like, the, the, the lead character is very sort of, like, maybe regressive or something, or, like, like you know, like old, like an old school misogynist or something, or, or the, 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 the themes don't, don't seem to be, like you say, like, well, opposed to me to error, maybe this story wouldn't work. Would you, would you level that criticism, or would you not necessarily think about that? Uh, it, it, I take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Like I've said, I've read uh, one or two Christian fundamentalist scripts, including ones that went into, like, pages and pages talking about how, if, how you're going to go to hell for not being Christian, you know, written in total earnest. And my general... I try to not talk about my opinions on the subject matters. What I say is, this is not going to have a wide appeal. You're not going to reach a wide audience because you're going to piss half your audience off. So if you want to reach an audience and be more successful, you want to be willing to reach out and you know, do a little bit of catering to an audience while, while still maintaining your vision for your story. Um, and I say the same thing with scripts that have stances that I agree with. Because I've read a lot of scripts that have a lot of... Um, have a lot of themes and deal with a lot of issues that I actually am 100% behind the author with. But the writer, but the author doesn't do it in a way that I find engaging in, in the form of a story. Like I've read a lot of environmentalist scripts. I'm an environmentalist, but uh, I think every environmentalist script I've read has been terrible. <laughs> on, and on the other hand, you know, I look at a movie like Dirty Harry, which I do not think that's how police work should be conducted, but I will absolutely pop that on on a Saturday night. <laughs> You're not looking at documentary scripts. No documentary scripts. It's all fiction. Are you, and you have no way of knowing whether the, this this writer is has had has been trained or is not. You have, if they generally I can or have taken classes. Or generally, I can tell just by looking at it. Oh really? Yeah. Like like I said, there have been some where you open up one page and you can just tell. Like the formatting. The formatting. The the font is the wrong size, the indentation is all wrong, and everything is just a, a mess. And then you open up another one, and you can tell, okay, this person at least knows the format. I'd say a good 70% of the scripts I read are absolutely perfectly formatted. Another 20% have like a couple of little flaws here and there. And then there's that, there's a, very, there's a very small percent, I'd say maybe one script every two months that is just a complete train wreck. So then most of the submissions are from people who have taken screenwriting class. Yeah, I would assume based on how they look. Either that or you know they've actually read scripts online and have figured out the rules or they have programs like Celtics or Final Draft or Use Writer Duet. Have you, have you just tossed a script aside after several pages? Uh, no. The, the, the only time I've ever done that and I always talk with my boss first and say, hey, can I get another one? It was with that uh, one script I mentioned earlier where the writer had sent it in twice before and I'd covered it twice. And then I read through the draft they sent and it was the exact same thing that I already covered. So I told my boss, I can't give the writer anything new here. Maybe they need a new set of eyes on it. And that was the one time I've done that. Would you agree that uh, when you look at a script, it's cursory, generally speaking, that a good script will have be balanced in its action and its dialogue, you know, throughout it on the pages. That's something I was, uh, that's advice I was given when turning in scripts. Maybe not to people like you, but maybe to people that are less inclined to suffer very many pages of uh, boredom or whatever. Yeah, I would say that's a fair that's a fair um, that's a fair point because I've read some scripts where they have like uh, one scene between two characters that goes on for like eight to ten pages, and of course that's way too long. But uh, one of the things I noticed is that in the really good scripts I read, 
they're able to, they can tell a really good scene in like a page and a half to two pages and it'll be a mixture of dialogue and visuals. Because I've read some scripts that make excellent use of set design where they will point out something in the room that tells something about a character or maybe a mark the character has on him. They'll basically use visuals to tell a story. I know I read uh, one back in January that was very much a Hitchcockian style thriller and it made exquisite use of visuals to try and tell its story so it didn't need a lot of dialogue for me to know what was going on. And in the scene description they'll explicitly say there's a relationship between this item in the scene and this part of the character? No, if the writer is really good they don't have to, I just know right. from reading it. So, any more questions? Well, thank you, sir. Hmm.